Isaiah 61, beginning to read at verse 1. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoner, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will burst. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in the land, and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for He has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of His righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the soil makes the young plant come up, and the garden causes the seed to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. This is the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your Word. So wonderful that we can hear your voice. We thank you for this magnificent prophecy in Isaiah, for the richness and wonder of its message. Help us to understand in our minds and to really be captivated in our hearts by what you have to say to us. Amen. Please do be seated and do turn to page 749, if you're using the Church Bibles, Isaiah 61. I was going to say you should have a handout in front of you, but I'm looking and there doesn't seem to be many handouts, so they're obviously that good that they've been stolen um, from their back because they were produced. Um, so, so there we are. It'll be, it'll be on the screen Anyway, uh, two years ago, we spent Christmas with um, my um, family, and there was uh, 18 of us in total. I, uh, there was a couple of guests invited along. There's always uh, a few others. And my sister introduced us to this new Christmas game, um, the exchange game. So what happens is she put a box full of wrapped um, presents, 18 of them, in the middle of the room. And then you were taking in turns to remove a present. So the first person would remove the present and then unwrap it. Then another person would remove a present. Before they unwrapped it, they had to decide whether they wanted to exchange their present with the present that they could see in the room. And then it went on like that. Now, of course, it was risky, very risky. You may make a good exchange, get rid of something rubbish, my sister alerted us to the fact that in the box were some great presents, some funny presents, and some crummy presents. So it was a risk. Now, I found the whole experience quite funny, but little Samuel was less amused when he got his Star Wars toy removed and received a carrot. <laughs> it's very interesting. This, this morning's passage, did you see when, we were, um, when I was reading it to you? I think it could be described as the greatest Christmas gift exchange ever. 
Isaiah 61 is a prophecy about the anointed one to come, the servant um, of the Lord, who will take some things from his people and will give them other things in exchange. Now, as New Testament um, believers, we know from Luke chapter 4 that it's a prophecy about Jesus, about the Messiah, about the Christ, who will do this great Christmas exchange. He will take from out of the people's hand worthless things and place into their hands a wonderful gift in exchange. This is why Jesus would come at Christmas to do the very things of Isaiah 61. This is why he was anointed by the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit at his baptism in the Jordan so that he could carry out this mission of Isaiah 61. This was his mission. This is his chapter. This is his purpose. So it's no surprise to us, is it, that in Luke chapter 4, and it's there on the screen if you want um, to read it, that when Jesus comes back to the town where he's brought up, Nazareth, and he goes into the synagogue, as was his custom, they pass him the scroll from Isaiah. He goes to Isaiah 61. He up, reads the opening verses, and then he sits down and he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He's come to do the great exchange. He says, look, you've been looking for the Messiah. Look no longer. Look no further. I'm right here in your midst to do the work of Isaiah 61. So it begins with the Lord's favor being proclaimed, verses 1 to 3. At the heart of the Spirit anointed servant's ministry is proclamation. You notice that in the first two verses, three times we read the word proclaim. He comes to proclaim something. Therefore, it's not surprising, is it, in Jesus' ministry, as you read the Gospels, that whenever he's speaking to the crowd and they're no longer interested in what he wants to teach, he says, let's move on to other towns and villages because that is why I have, Isaiah 61, that is why I've come, that they might hear the good news, that I might proclaim the message. He will proclaim a turnaround of fortune for the people. Isn't that what we see in Isaiah 61? A turnaround of fortune for the people. But before I unpack this turnaround, who is this good news for? It's good news for the poor, for the humble, for the lowly, for the needy, for the afflicted. The Spirit-anointed servant, the Christ, looks for those who have been passed over, the outcast, those who realize that they need a Savior, they need a deliverer, they need an exchange. It comes not for those who think they're well, but it comes for the sick. He has good news, good news for those who will realize just how desperately they need a deliverer. His, his message is one of, that will bind up the broken hearted. That's what it says. What wonderful imagery. It's just a, such a beautiful um, verse, uh, isn't it, to meditate upon. Those whose hearts are shattered into pieces will have them fixed. What a great exchange. Jesus says that you give to me your broken heart and I give you in return a healed heart. You give me a shattered heart, and I will give you a restored heart. That's the healing work of the Messiah. And for the original readers, how their hearts would be broken. They're going to be carried away from their land. They're going to see their nation toppled. They're going to see their temple demolished. Everything they'd known, everything they'd loved, Everything they'd relied upon, everything that their life had revolved around, gone. Their hearts would surely be shattered into a thousand pieces. But Isaiah says, the servant will come and will bind up the brokenhearted. 
on a deeper spiritual level. This speaks to those who are poor in spirit, those who are broken over their sin. That's how Jesus picks it up, doesn't he, in the Beatitudes in Matthew and Luke. Those who are grieved over what they have done to God and against God. And the seventh says, look, there's good news for the poor in spirit. There's good news for those people who realize that before God they're morally bankrupt. There's good news for those people whose hearts are broken over and by their sin. Because he will bind them up. He will heal them. That's good news, isn't it? That's what makes Christmas worth celebrating. But it also says he will set captives free. There's good news for the prisoner. He proclaims liberty to the captives and freedom for the prisoners. For the people of Judah, remember, they've been deported, carried off into exile, living as slaves in a foreign land under the influence of a pagan power. And the reality for them is you have no will in that situation. You have no say. You have no vote. You're under the mastery of another. You're crushed. You're confined. You're incarcerated. That is their experience. And in that situation, when they're carried off into exile, their hearts may cry out, can anyone rescue me? Can anyone break the chains of my slavery? And Isaiah tells them now, Messiah will when he comes. Those sitting in darkness will see the light of day. Can you imagine how that would feel, this message for the Israelites as they sit in the darkness of exile in Babylon and they're told that they're going to be set free? Do you remember the news um, sort of videos of the um, 2010 Chilean mining accident. Do you remember that? 33 men trapped 700 meters underground for 69 days. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine one, one day? <laughs> and then the joy on their faces when they're individually brought up on a, a winch to the surface and they just come out jubilant. Of course they do. And my dear friends, the Bible is very clear that we were trapped in the cave of our own corruption, sunk in a pit of our own despair, buried under the weight of our own sink, enclosed in the darkness of our own belief. Then Messiah came. And he flooded the room with light, lifted us, from the pit and restored us, breaking the bars of our prison. I reckon, on my personal opinion, no one has captured this as well as Charles Wedley, Wesley, who wrote in And Can It Be, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose went forth and followed thee. He came with a message of liberty. And he will restore what was taken away, verses 2 and 3. He comes to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is um, a reference to the year of Jubilee. There was provision in the um, Israelite law that um, every 50th year, all slaves could be set free. All debts had to be cancelled. All land um, that had been sold or taken for debt should be returned. Now, can you imagine that? What it would mean um, for us maybe is all your loans are paid off. Your mortgage is cancelled. Every single debt that you've got uh, is settled. The student um, loan is gone. Wow, isn't that the year of the Lord's favor. This year of Jubilee was meant to be an Old Testament picture of salvation through Christ. And didn't 
the Lord himself proclaim the Lord's favor. For he was the one who said that the debt of sin would be canceled. The prison bars that Satan constructed would be swung wide open. He would bind up the strong man and he would restore the destitute. Just look at verse 3, the wonderful um, imagery. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Is this not the greatest Christmas gift exchange ever? But before we move on, let me, it's worth um, noting, because some may ask about it afterwards, so I'll say it now, that Jesus did stop reading before and the day, um, and the day of vengeance of our God. He stopped reading before that part. So why? Why? The day of vengeance is about divine judgment, and Jesus had plenty to say about that. I think it's be, this is the reason. For Israel, the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God it was part of the same event. You see, they would be liberated from Babylon, and in, as they were liberated from Babylon, Babylon itself would be destroyed. Do you see? So it's the one event brings about the two things, the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God. However, for Jesus... The day of the vengeance of our God was to be fully seen in his second summit coming, not his first. So we could put it like this. In his earthly ministry, in his first coming, he proclaimed the year of the Lord's favor. In his second coming, at his return, he will bring about the day of God's vengeance. For the Israelites, one event. For Jesus, two advents. His first coming and his second coming, but fulfilling both. But it doesn't end with the proclamation of um, favor. The Lord's favor is displayed, verses 4 to 7. Uh, here are some of the practical outworkings of what the Lord is proclaiming to them, what he will do. <clears throat> At the end of verse 3, we read, they will be called oaks of righteousness. Now that's in comparison to Isaiah chapter 1, when they've been told that they will be oaks with fading leaves. Do you see the comparison? So, they are oaks with fading leaves. That's what they will become, Isaiah chapter 1. That's an idea of them diminishing. And God will make them oaks of righteousness, which is the idea of enduring. So God is going to take what is diminishing from their hands and give them what is enduring. The image of the trees is paralleled with planting. They're going to be an oak of righteousness at the end of verse 3. Precisely because the Lord is going to plant them as a display for his splendor. And how will this be worked out? Well, this section on rebuilding. Verse 4. What was destroyed will be rebuilt. They're going to have a place on the earth again. God will establish them in the land so that they can shine forth of his righteousness. This is nothing short of the promise of God to restore them to their former glory. And of course, we know that the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy is in the new creation. The new creation, the place where Jesus reigns and where two Peter will say it is what? The home of righteousness. Where they will be the city of righteousness. What was lost in the garden will be regained in a city. God will establish us. But also, verse 5, what they had done will be done for them. Did you notice that? When the Messiah comes to work, he not only comes to deliver his people, but to transform their situation. In exile, they were the ones shepherding people's flocks. They were the ones working other people's fields. They were the ones collecting the grapes in the vineyards uh, of their masters. Now all that's going to change. It's all going to be reversed. They're going to be waited on. They are going to be elevated and exalted. 
Isaiah 61 teaches, and as it's worked out in the New Testament, we see it clearly, that the Lord does not rescue his people, and he doesn't lift us up just to be on a level playing field with the rest of the nations. No, he seats us in the royal box, so to speak. Isn't it interesting? In, in Revelation, it picks up the same language that it says the kings and rulers of the earth will bring their splendor into the city. For who to enjoy? Us. The people of God. Planted, established, elevated. And what they had lost will be regained, verse 6. They're restored for a purpose. They'll be called priests of the Lord and named ministers of God. God saves his people, saves the redeemed that they might serve. It has always been God's purpose that he has his people established in a place in order that they can be a light to the nations. That was Israel's calling. But the fulfillment of it has come upon who? The church. For the Spirit-anointed servant has come along and purchased for himself a people who he now establishes, although scattered in the earth, for the purpose of making the Lord known. But why will the Lord do all this? Why will favor be proclaimed? Why will favor be displayed? Well, the Lord's favor is explained in verses 8 and 9. The Lord explains his actions in terms of his justice, doesn't he? He acts because of what he is like. Everything that is going to take place, the Israelites being carried away into captivity and the land being devastated, the Israelites being brought back from captivity and the land being restored, is all because the Lord is just. That's why he's going to do it all. And is the Lord's favor at the cross not supremely about his justice and love? How do you explain the Lord's favor in terms of his justice and his love? But the Lord also explains his action in terms of his on renown, verse 9, when the Lord restores his people, the end result is that the people, the nations will know that the Lord, it is the Lord who blesses his people. God says, look, I give good things with the end result that people will give me glory. Not just so that they will be elevated, but so that the Lord's name will be elevated amongst the people. Which brings me to the last point and the concluding part of Isaiah 61. The Lord's favor enjoyed. This lifting up of the people by God causes the people to lift up their voices. Did you notice that? Verse 10, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. Is that not a fitting response? I delight greatly in the Lord, and my soul rejoices in my God. Or later on in verse 11, God will make righteousness and praise spring up from the land. Is that a wonderful image as well? That praise will, will spring up like fresh shoots springing up from the ground, all in response to the Lord's favor upon the people. I read the story the other um, day about a man who visited a social um, club. Um, you got the picture on the screen? He was, um, so that's not him, that's Frank Sinatra. But he saw three men, this is the story that's told, he saw three men and a dog playing cards. And after watching for a while, he turned to one of the players and he says, can that dog really play cards? And he replied, he sure can, yes. So watched for a, bit, a little bit longer and said, that's incredible. And the guy says, not really. It's rubbish. It's rubbish. Yeah, yeah. Every time he's got a good hand, he can't help but wag his tail. <laughs> you see, when I read this passage, 
it seems very apparent to me that we have been dealt by the Lord the best hand ever, have we not? The Lord's servant has dealt as a wonderful hand. And our tongues should be unceasing as they wag in praise of him. Our delight should overflow abundantly in praise of him. Because we received such a sweet deal. Jesus says, I will take from you your hand, your lousy package. Remember that opening illustration of poverty and brokenness and captivity and prison and debt and oppression and mourning? And I will place in your hands good news, wholeness of heart, liberty, release, victory, mercy, comfort. Let me conclude. Our response to the greatest Christmas gift exchange is to greatly rejoice in the Lord our God. Look how it's put in, in verse 10. He has wonderfully clothed us with the garments of salvation, with the robe of righteousness. He is the one who has kitted us out and made us beautiful. And compare that to what we were dressed in apart from Christ, ugly, sin-stained rags. Is it not glorious that he has taken these paupers and made us princes? See, Jesus clothes us with the glistening white robes of his righteousness. And that's quite an exchange, isn't it? <laughs> A wonderful, glorious Blessed, joyous exchange that elicits praise from the people. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord, if we clearly see our position outside of the work of the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come before him in that poverty of spirit, recognizing that we have nothing to offer. Oh, there is such comfort. For the rags of our filthiness are removed, and we are clothed in the pure white garment of the righteousness of Christ. What a blessed exchange. What a glorious future awaits us. What a wonderful thing you have done for your people. May praise spring up in this congregation. Amen.